You know what I find a little weird? The idea of Christmas stories. Mainly because it's really hard to figure out a good conflict for them. Like, what do you even do? The stakes are not exactly astronomical, are they? I mean, it's Christmas, not the end of the world. I think this is part of why Christmas stories tend to have a pretty bad reputation overall. It's always some working woman with no time for holiday cheer who comes home for the holidays only to fall in love with the local Christmas tree farmer. That or some villain with a bizarre, artificial reason to destroy the holiday. They want to control the seasons. They just hate happiness. They were bullied during Christmas as a little green hairy child. But I think all of that is kind of sidestepping the issue. I think there is a conflict built right into the holiday. It's just kind of hard to stomach. So instead, we get these weird conflicts about Scrooges who are just ideologically opposed to the holiday for some reason, or Grinches who just have some ridiculous motivation to sabotage it. It all feels very forced. If we were to be honest about the conflicts inherent to this whole thing, I think instead of a Scrooge or a Grinch as our Christmas story antagonist, we might just end up with an anti-Grinch. Speaking of holiday conflicts, in the middle of all this sweetness and selflessness and holiday cheer, it's hard not to think about all the people who are going without right now. And, I mean, what can you really do? You can't expect to solve all the world's problems from your computer chair, but you can help more than you think. This year we donated $100 to charity, which was already a nice feeling. But because we did it through our sponsor, GiveWell, they doubled that amount. And they'll do it for you, too. GiveWell is offering fans of Tail Foundry a chance to make the world a better place without the massive burden of research, because they do it all for you to make sure your money is making the biggest possible impact. And if you let them know you learned about them through Tail Foundry, they'll also match what you give up to $100. Check the description for details. Definitely one of our favorite sponsors ever. The Grinch is probably not a character I need to explain to you. His story has become something of a Christmas time parable. He hates the holiday and all its little rituals to the point of obsession. He even manages to steal the holiday itself, or at least every prop, decoration, material possession that makes it recognizable from the people trying to celebrate it. He is, meaningfully, the opposite of Santa Claus. But this video is not about Santa Claus. Not really. As defined by the website TV Tropes, the Anti-Grinch is not a character opposite the Grinch. It's a character whose attitude is opposite the Grinch, but who still ruins the holiday anyway. These are characters so hopped up on all the paraphernalia and rituals of Christmas that they forget the entire point of celebrating and bring the whole thing down in the process. If you've ever seen The Nightmare Before Christmas, you already know what this looks like. In the movie, the King of Halloween, Jack Skellington, discovers Christmas as a concept and becomes immediately enamored with it. Exhausted with his role as an icon of a stagnant, unchanging Halloween tradition, he tries to take over Christmas for a season. Unsurprisingly, it's a hard concept for the Halloween folk to grasp. The version they end up creating is, we'll say, decidedly less jolly than the average Christmas. Dead animals recycled into seasonal attire, murderous toys and shrunken heads wrapped up in colorful paper, a skeleton masquerading as old Saint Nick. They're trying their best, but they just can't quite get it right. After having Santa Claus abducted, Jack finally takes to the sky himself on Christmas Eve and travels around the world, inadvertently bringing terror into the hearts and homes of children everywhere. The chaos only ends when his sleigh is finally shot out of the sky by the United States military and Santa is released from captivity to set things right. Jack is a lot different from the Grinch in that they have opposite feelings about the holiday, but they're actually shockingly similar in terms of how they understand the holiday. 
For the Grinch, it's an obnoxious, materialistic seasonal clamor that destroys his sense of peace and stands in harsh opposition to his ascetic lifestyle. For Jack, it's a novel, exciting set of rituals that are so different from anything he's ever encountered before, it's incredibly easy for him to idealize them. For both of them, Christmas is pretty shallow. A holiday defined by aesthetics, routines, packages, boxes, and bags. The Grinch hates that, Jack loves it, and for both of them, it's this interpretation that ultimately leads them to destroy Christmas. The thing is, though, the Grinch's sentiment is kind of rare. Maybe you could cast atheists or non-Christians or anyone who advocates for a more secular, generalized version of seasonal celebrations into this role, but I don't think that's a fair comparison. Overall, I think it would be pretty exceptional to find someone within a culture which celebrates Christmas who hates it enough to try and destroy it. What I'm saying is that I think the Grinch is kind of a straw man built to reinforce the value of the holiday. Honestly, I think there are very few actual Grinches out there. But Jack, on the other hand? Oh, there are Jacks and Jacks and Jacks. Unlike the Grinch, Jack puts forth an actual critique of people who do exist. Every host who works themselves up into an anxious episode over throwing the perfect Christmas party. Every family who forces uncomfortable familial dynamics for the sake of the holiday, but neglects to address the underlying issues for the rest of the year. Every shopper so fixated on purchasing the right gift in the right time frame that they'll trample other human beings to death to get it for 25% off. And here I thought the dead animal gifts were macabre. Interestingly, in the end, both Jack and the Grinch learn the same fundamental lesson, that there's something deeper going on here. A reason so many people participate in this holiday beyond the cynical materialism and simple adherence to tradition. They find that, stripped of all the things that they thought the holiday was about, they actually rather enjoy spending time with the people around them in a gentle, compassionate, tender way. Turns out, it's quite nice to have a period of time during the year so dedicated to sentimentality. So, that's it, right? Case closed. The Anti-Grinch is here to tell us that ritual and tradition are kind of silly, and that you should just focus on the emotionality behind the gestures. Wouldn't everyone be happier if they did away with the tinsel and gift wrap and celebrated in a way that truly matters to them? Well, that's what Jack's story seems to say. But there's another interesting example of this archetype that goes in quite the opposite direction. The book The Hogfather from Terry Pratchett's Discworld series is perhaps one of my favorite stories ever written. It's about a figure called the Hogfather, which is Discworld's equivalent of Santa Claus, and what happens when he goes missing. The answer? Honestly, not a whole lot. That's because he has a stand-in. Someone else who also knows the home address of everyone in the world who can also make it to all of them in a single night. The only logical choice for the job, death. That's right, our second anti-Grinch is another skeleton masquerading as Santa Claus. Weird, I promise they're not all like this. Like Jack, it's a bit hard for death to wrap his skull around some parts of the holiday. One of my favorite scenes from the book involves him standing in as a department store hogfather, you know the kind, where, instead of filling children's heads with materialistic wishes for toys that their parents will buy later, he obliges each and every child's wish by using his magic to immediately conjure the toy they want, much to the dismay of the store's manager. At one point, a little girl asks for a sword, which Death is happy to give her. When the adults in the store fly into a panic because a child shouldn't have a weapon, Death says, it's educational. When they say that she might hurt herself, he says, that will be an important lesson. But these misunderstandings never lead to catastrophe in quite the way that Jacks do. In fact, you can argue that Death is actually playing the role a little too well. Because unlike Jack, he's not just performing rituals, he's trying to give true gifts to people which have the potential to meaningfully change their lives. At one point, he encounters what is essentially the little match girl from Hans Christian Andersen's story of the same name. As in the story, she's about to freeze to death on a doorstep. Recognizing that her death is unfair and trying to fulfill his role, he actively goes against his duties as death and spares her life. 
This obviously does not sound like a bad thing, and it's not, but it is an abdication of both his roles. This is not bolstering the belief in the holiday or participating in the rituals, and this is not honoring his mantle as death, this is simply him changing reality in a very useful, very direct way. It's a good thing for the recipients of his gifts, but a bad thing for the holiday and what it means to everyone who celebrates it. And that matters because the reason death is bothering to fill in for the Hogfather at all is that it is essential that the world not lose their belief in this figure. The Hogfather is one of those small, actualizing beliefs through which humans embrace their role as interpreters and shapers of reality. The rituals surrounding it, as silly as they may be, are a surrogate for understanding and engaging with that role. They hold meaning. They give weight to things. In Discworld, they literally allow for the creation of gods, and in the Hogfather's absence, that leftover belief even begins to manifest as a variety of silly, inconsequential deities. It's a powerful effect, and in reality, the effect of ritual is not so different. No, perhaps tinsel, gift wrap, and Black Friday sales are not exactly spiritually fulfilling, but there is a reason people engage with the holiday's rituals beyond adherence to tradition. When applied meaningfully, rituals are powerful. Singing the same song as everyone else in the room, or decorating your home in a similar way to everyone else on your block, creates an incredible feeling of community and solidarity. As cynical as it can sometimes be, giving gifts is a thoughtful gesture, and some people do feel as though they need an excuse to do it. Filling the darkest season of the year with lights and warmth and company and good food it's not hard to see why that would be helpful, but you might not gravitate toward it automatically if it just felt indulgent. The ritualization of these things helps make them feel culturally validated. And, on a personal level, there's even research which suggests that engaging in rituals has powerful psychosomatic effects that would be hard to replicate otherwise. You can absolutely make yourself and your world feel different and better by engaging in these otherwise irrational practices. It might not be believing gods into existence like in Discworld, but it is important, and the holiday would absolutely not be the same without it. In Death's words, Humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. And ritual is certainly a part of that. Christmas stories are weird because it often seems as if, to justify their own existence, they have to make Christmas into some big important thing unto itself. The characters always discover the true meaning of Christmas, and their lives, and the lives of those around them, and sometimes the entire cosmos and all of space-time, change for the better as a result. But to me, that seems a little backward. The Grinch is an interesting hypothetical. What if you didn't have all the paraphernalia of the holiday? What if it was just you and the people you love? Would Christmas still happen? The story says that yes, it would, because those things aren't what makes Christmas Christmas. But I think the anti-Grinch has an even more salient message. These anti-Grinch characters who celebrate the holiday way too hard always end up losing something in the process. Jack finds out that, when you engage in rituals for their own sake without understanding what they mean, they become meaningless very quickly. In Hogfather, Death finds out that, although you may be embodying the ethos of the holiday, without the rituals you're just… being… nice? You lose nearly all of what the observation of the holiday stands to give you, and you just end up doing stuff that, frankly, you should probably be doing year-round. I don't know if this is what the authors meant when they created these characters, but as an admirer of humanity from the outside, it's something I see a lot. When you don't understand the rituals you're engaging with, you fall into a state of nihilism, aimed pointlessly at nothing, doing things simply because you know to do them. But then, when you escape ritualism and you try to do everything purely on the basis of utility, you end up living these dull, unenchanted lives bereft of all the power ritual could otherwise bring to them. This video is not about Christmas. It's about how you live your life, all the rituals you make a part of it, and why you observe them.
This season, when you celebrate whatever holidays you do celebrate, perhaps think less about their true meaning and more about what they truly mean to you. Giving is certainly among the most beloved of all seasonal rituals, and it's hard not to see why. It's nice to be selfless for a season, to have a reason to think of others. But then, when you start to think about how many people aren't so lucky who are going without this year, it's easy to feel like this too is a hollow ritual. You can't save the world by yourself. You can't possibly give enough to fix everyone's problems, can you? It's easy to feel sort of nihilistic when you think too hard about it. But one of humanity's greatest strengths lies in its sheer numbers. There are so many of you that any tiny, otherwise ineffectual effort, when magnified by thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people repeating it, can truly change the world. There are, of course, plenty of charities you could go through to do this. Give a little of your extra income to make things better. It's a nice idea, but also a little daunting. How can you feel confident that your donations are really making a big impact? You could do weeks of research to find the right charities, figure out what they do, how effective they are, and how that charity might use the additional money. Or you could just visit GiveWell.org. There, you'll find free research and recommendations about the charities that can save or improve lives around the world most per dollar. GiveWell spends over $30,000 each year researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact, evidence-backed opportunities they've found. Over 100,000 donors like you have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. And the best part of all? Using GiveWell's research is totally free. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. They publish all their research and recommendations on their site for free, no sign-up required. When you make a donation, they allocate it to the charity or fund you choose without taking a cut, and you even get to write it off as a tax deduction. This season, we wanted to give a little to the people we felt needed most, but that's sort of a hard thing to quantify. So, considering GiveWell's track record and all their available research, we were able to simply put a little money toward their top charities fund, their all grants fund, and an unrestricted fund, which will help make sure our $100 gets used in the best way possible to make the largest possible impact. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your first donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org, click Donate, and when asked how did you first hear about GiveWell, choose YouTube and write Tail Foundry in the box. That way, they know you're coming from our channel, and they know to match your donation all the way up to $100. A huge thanks to GiveWell for this opportunity to share something really positive with all of you. This is by far the easiest way to remove the research burden of helping to change the world. You can finally give a little bit in an easy, informed way. I hope you'll join in. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye.